to speak? Je voudrais commencer par dire nous pensons nous pensons au sujet de nos amis en Royaume-Uni. We think about our friends in the United Kingdom at this time, knowing that they're facing a, uh, a tragedy. We think about the families who are facing something that is uh, indescribably difficult. I'd like to start just by saying that that is uh, important for all of us to reflect upon. Monsieur le Président, je suis heureux de prendre la parole devant la Chambre aujourd'hui pour déposer les documents budgétaires de 2017, y compris les avis de motion de voie et moyen. Les détails concernant les mesures sont exposés dans ces documents et je demande que l'étude de ces motions soit inscrite à l'ordre du jour. Je tiens aussi à annoncer que le gouvernement déposera des mesures législatives pour exécuter les mesures de budget. Mr. Speaker, as Canadians come together to celebrate Canada 150, we proudly reflect on the generations that came before us. Generations that built a country on the belief that, with hope and hard work, they could deliver a better future for themselves and for their children and for their grandchildren. That optimism and that confidence helped define us as a country. Sharing those beliefs with others made Canada a beacon of diversity, openness, and generosity around the world. Yet, over the last few decades, the middle class and those working hard to join it have fallen behind. Everyday folks who work hard to provide for their families are worried about the future. They're worried that rapid technological change, the seemingly never-ending need for new skills, and growing demands on our time mean that their kids won't have the same opportunities that they have. And Mr. Speaker, who can blame them? For a decade, middle-class struggles were simply swept under the rug. People were left without a clear vision at a time of unprecedented change. But the good news is that Canadians, on their own accord, worked hard and persevered. We've always been resilient and innovative, able to adapt and prosper in the face of change. Sachant cela, nous avons élaboré un plan visant à assurer que, dans un monde en évolution, la classe moyenne et ceux qui travaillent fort pour en faire partie puissent réussir. Il y a un an et demi, notre gouvernement s'est engagé à apporter un changement visant à améliorer de façon concrète la vie des Canadiens et des Canadiens. Nous sommes, nous sommes engagés à aider les gens à prendre leur retraite avec dignité. Nous nous sommes engagés à demander aux plus riches de 1 de payer un peu plus afin de pouvoir réduire les impôts so de la classe moyenne. Nous nous sommes engagés à faire des investissements judicieux et responsables dans nos communautés. Et c'est exactement ce que That's nous avons exactly fait. Nous avons tenu nos promesses et nous ne faisons que commencer. Now, we realize that there's much more hard work in front of us than behind us. But I remain inspired that we're on the right path. One of the most memorable moments I've had as Canada's finance minister actually happened in a taxi cab in Toronto. On the way home one night, my taxi cab driver, Mian, recognized me, and we started chatting. Then he did something that surprised me. He called his wife, and he put her on the speakerphone. They wanted to talk to me about the difference that the Canada Child Benefit had made in their lives. Yeah. You'll remember, Mr. Speaker, that this benefit gives 9 out of 10 Canadian families with kids more help with the high cost of managing their family. In Mian's case, with three children aged 11, 9, and 10 months, the Canada Child Benefit means that he and his wife receive about $300 more each month than they did a year ago. That's an extra $3,600 tax-free every year. 
money that can be put towards groceries, school supplies, and new clothes for going back to school. There are countless other stories just like this one across the country, each a sign that confidence is building and that our plan for middle class prosperity is working. Stories like Dave's, a plumber from British Columbia who took advantage of a training program supported by the federal government to get his Red Seal certification last year. Now he has a well-paying job and is able to return to and work in his community. Ilya Nubis, Nebis, a mother of three from a remote Algonquin community in Quebec. The Canada Child Benefit has helped her three kids enrolled in hockey this season. Dave Nubis, like millions of middle class Canadians, want to see progress for themselves and their families. They want a government that puts people first. They want a government focused on creating good jobs today while also preparing Canadians for the jobs of tomorrow. They want a government that puts our skilled, talented, and creative people at the heart of a more innovative and globally competitive Canada. Mr. Speaker, here's our plan. Across the country, we're building stronger communities. We're doing it by creating jobs, shortening commutes, ensuring clean air and water, and improving quality of life for millions of Canadians. In the last year and a half, 744 public transit projects have been approved. In Ottawa, long-awaited and transformative light rail projects are underway. In Montreal and Vancouver, Riders can look forward to a more enjoyable commute thanks to rehabilitation work being done to the metro and SkyTrain systems. We're repairing nearly 50,000 social housing units to make sure families have a safe and a secure place to live. We've lifted 18 long-term boil water advisories in First Nations communities mm -hmm. because <laughs> our work continues because we will not stop until every child in Canada has access to clean drinking water. Ten years from now, our cities, towns, northern and rural communities will be healthier and better connected. Our air and our water will be cleaner. More Canadian goods will get to international markets. And modern, efficient public transit systems will get hard-working parents home more quickly at the end of a long day. As we look to the coming decades, we also see the potential of new innovations to transform our lives. Self-driving cars artificial intelligence, genomics, quantum computing, mobile payments, the sharing economy. These ideas are changing our world for the better, just like the innovations that preceded them. A few decades ago, we never could have imagined how mobile computing would impact our lives. Thanks to e-commerce platforms, an Alberta farmer can sell top quality beef to millions of potential buyers all over the world. And cutting-edge research from Montreal has led to breakthrough treatments for multiple sclerosis. Mr. Speaker, we must see the immense opportunities that these changes bring with them, opportunities for progress and prosperity. And while the rapid chase, chase, pace of change can seem dizzying at times, we must never lose sight of what's driving these breakthrough innovations, people. People like Mian, Dave, and Nubis. And so, as we create the jobs of tomorrow, we'll support a culture of lifelong learning to help workers and their families adapt to the changing demands of our time. We'll help students get the skills and work experience they need mm -hmm. to kickstart their careers. We'll make it more affordable for thousands of parents of young children to learn new skills while raising their families and will give people who've lost their jobs a chance to go back to school for further training, helping those Canadians to advance their careers and turn challenges into opportunities.
To give our young people the best possible start, we will promote hands-on learning in science, technology, engineering, and math, especially for young women, girls, and indigenous youth. Building on work being done by impressive organizations like Ladies Learning Code and Actua will encourage students to learn coding in the same way they learn to read and write preparing our kids for the jobs of the future. Mr. Speaker, Budget 2017 is about creating good middle-class jobs now and in the years to come. And to do that, we need to focus on our strengths, where we can lead globally and create good jobs for Canadians. In this budget, we're making investments in six economic sectors where Canada can lead the way. Digital, clean tech, agri-food, advanced manufacturing, biosciences, and clean resources. In the realm of digital technology, I know two things to be true, Mr. Speaker. One, Canada can be a world leader. And two, we just can't afford not to be. That's why we will launch a pan-Canadian artificial intelligence strategy and bring together Canada's main centres of AI expertise to drive investment and job creation across the country. In agri-food, too, we're positioned for success. By 2050, global demand for food is expected to rise by 70 per cent. That means more demand for prairie canola, Atlantic crab and lobster, and BC berries. It also means more jobs in the fields of southwestern Ontario and on the maple syrup farms of Quebec's eastern townships. We'll help farmers, producers, and processors build their businesses globally and do so sustainably. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know that our environment and our economy go hand in hand. It's why we've worked with the provinces and territories to adopt the pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change. This not only means cleaner air to breathe, it means business and investment opportunities. That means the jobs installing solar cells, manufacturing electric cars, or developing cleaner fuels will be in high demand. Well, luckily, our energy sector is already well positioned to not only compete, but to lead. By investing in clean tech and responsible resource development, will preserve our environment for future generations, create great jobs, and restake our claim as a leading supplier of energy to the world for the next 150 years. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our plan is clear. Smart, ambitious investments in people, communities, and high growth industries lead to opportunity. Opportunity leads to jobs. Jobs lead to a more confident and growing middle class. And a more confident, growing middle class is the only path to a strong and sustained economic growth. The government's role in all of this is to lend support to those who are driving us forward and to make sure that everyone has a real and fair chance at success. This means, first of all, ensuring that our most basic needs are met and health and well-being are at the very top of that list. Though our universal health care system is a source of pride for many Canadians, we know that more can be done for families caring for aging or disabled loved ones. It's why this budget provides support for caregivers helping loved ones at home and makes it easier for Canadians living with disabilities to get the tax relief they need. Mr. Speaker, we believe that whether their ailments are physical or mental, Canadians deserve the best possible care that we can provide. They deserve our help. And I'm pleased that with leadership from the Minister of Health, over the last several months, we've reached health agreements with nearly every single province and territory. Through these landmark agreements and historic health transfers to province and territories, representing over 
$200 billion over the next five years, we'll reduce stress for families. We'll ensure that every young person under the age of 25 gets the mental health support that they need and deserve. Mr. Speaker, having had the honour of representing and meeting families in St. Jamestown and Regent Park in Toronto, I've seen firsthand the challenge of affordable housing. And so, it's my privilege to announce that the government will be investing over $11 billion, the largest single commitment in Budget 2017. And this, Mr. Speaker, is in support of a national housing strategy to protect every Canadian's right to a safe, an affordable place to call home. Our government has shown and will continue to show national leadership on housing. And we will prioritize support for vulnerable citizens, including seniors, Indigenous peoples, survivors fleeing domestic violence, persons with disabilities, those dealing with mental health issues, and veterans. Mr. Speaker, the decisions we make and the policies we create impact men and women differently. In order to make laws and develop policies and programs that are in the best interests of all Canadians, we have to know what kind of impact they will have. We know, for example, that while Canadian companies are getting better when it comes to hiring more women, they're still less effective at promoting women to senior roles. And we know that fewer women join or stay in the workforce than men. That means that as a country, we're not taking full advantage of the talents, the insights, and the experiences of more than half of our population. It makes no sense. We need to do better. And so as a first step, we've asked the Canada-United States Council for Advancement of Women Entrepreneurs and Business Leaders to quickly advise us on how we can better empower women entrepreneurs and remo remove barriers for women in business. But not all, not all obstacles to, to progress are obvious. So in Budget 2017, we did something that should have been done a long time ago. We published the government's first ever gender statement, an assessment that ensures that all budget measures, not just those aimed specifically at women, help us advance the goals of fairness, gender equality, and stronger workforce participation. Mr. Speaker, we realize that this is just the start, and we look forward to feedback on this, this first effort, which we will then build into future budgets. Another challenge we must confront, Mr. Speaker, is access to quality child care. Too often we hear stories of single parents living in poverty because the cost of child care is so high that they can't afford to go back to work, and that's not acceptable in our country. To help low- and middle-income families with the cost of child care, we're committing $7 billion over the next decade to increase the number of high-quality child care spaces available across our country. In order to provide immediate relief, this will be working together with provinces and territories, and we know that doing this could create up to 40,000 new subsidized childcare spaces over the next three years. <laughs> Canadian parents deserve our support, and we're delivering. Mr. Speaker, we know that strong partnerships between the federal government and Indigenous communities are crucial for our success. Over the next five years, funding for Indigenous peoples will have increased by over 27 percent from what it was when this government took office, well in excess of what would have been provided under the decades-old 2 percent funding cap, and will contribute to a higher quality of life on reserves while setting Canada on a path towards true reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. This work continues today 
both because it's a recognition of the rights of Indigenous peoples and because it's essential to our economic future. Ensemble, Together, we will build stronger, more resilient communities and renew our nation-to-nation -nation relationship with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We'll help to break down employment barriers with a focus on skills development, training, and better education. And we'll provide greater access to mental health, wellness, and suicide prevention services while working with Indigenous communities to combat substance abuse. This is our plan for Canada. For it to succeed, we all have to do our share. Mr. Speaker, I've been very fortunate in my life to have had a successful career in business, and I've always paid my fair share of taxes. But it can be tempting for some to be too aggressive in their tax planning. Our review of federal tax expenditures, for example, highlighted a number of issues around tax planning, strategies using private corporations, strategies that can result in some very wealthy individuals getting tax breaks at the expense of others. Mr. Le Président, les Canadiens s'attendent à ce que le régime fiscal soit équitable. Notre gouvernement s'est engagé à prendre des mesures sécuritaires et nous allons plus à dire à ce sujet dans un avenir en plus de temps. One of our government's very first actions was to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so that we could cut taxes for the middle class. Because of this tax cut, 9 million Canadians see more money on every single paycheck. That, Mr. Speaker, is change that makes a real difference in people's lives. We also gave the Canada Revenue Agency more resources to detect, audit, and combat illegal tax evasion and aggressive tax avoidance. Going forward, we'll close loopholes that result in unfair tax advantages for some at the expense of others. We'll eliminate inefficient tax measures, especially those that disproportionately benefit the wealthy. And we'll work with the provinces and the territories to crack down on those who hide their identity to avoid paying taxes in our country. Because, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear, all Canadians must pay their fair share of taxes. Mm -hmm. Period. Mr. Speaker, Canada has always played an important role on the international stage. And going forward, as needs change, so too will our approach. When it comes to international aid, for example, we remain committed to helping the most vulnerable people of the world, and we will continue to modernize approach, our approach in order to have better results, improve transparency, and foster innovation. Women and men in uniform in increasingly complex and unpredictable times, our government will soon release a new defense policy for Canada, following extensive consultation and analysis. Mr. Speaker, we also know that as a trading nation, our future depends on openness and investment. And that means never missing an opportunity to remind the world of what makes Canada a great place to live, to play, and to do business. Nowhere is this truer than with our neighbors to the south. Canada and the U.S. have the most successful economic relationship in the world, supporting millions of middle-class jobs on both sides of the border. We're proud of this fact. And we're also proud to have recently concluded CETA, a free trade agreement that will create jobs, reduce red tape, and give Canadian businesses preferred access to half a billion potential customers across the European Union. And as we prepare for the global economy of tomorrow, we'll put our best foot forward, always looking to develop strategic partnerships to attract talent and investment. Partnerships that will help our companies succeed, create good middle-class jobs here at home, and do well globally. Mr. Speaker, Canada 150 reminds us all that we have so much to be thankful for. Sur le plan économique, notre main du Economically, our talented, skilled, educated, diverse, and innovative workforce gives us tremendous potential for growth. 
Our values, our stories, and our cultures shine for the world to see. Our official languages are flourishing, and they open an entire world to us and make our country unique. Our natural beauty, they're unparalleled, allowing us to share the joys of building a campfire with our kids, hiking with a college friend, or swimming in cool, clean waters. In fact, this year we're putting our national parks on full display as we invite Canadians and families from around the world to enjoy them free of charge. Most importantly, Mr. Speaker, we've begun to see signs of confidence and optimism return to the middle class. Consumer spending is up since we introduced the Canada Child Benefit. In the last seven months, we've seen a quarter million new jobs. Mm -hmm. The best job gains in over a decade. Unemployment has fallen in the time since we took office. These are good early signs that our plan is working. That's why we will continue to invest in our people, our communities, and our economy while maximizing every dollar and ensuring it is well spent. We also want to make sure that our debt to GDP ratio. Our approach to investing um, remains positively will enable us to maintain our enviable position as the G7 nation with the best balance sheet. Most importantly, at the same time, we'll have built a better future for our kids. Mm -hmm. But, Mr. Speaker, we know that there's so much more to do on behalf of middle class Canadians. Middle class Canadians like Mian, Dave, and Nubis, working together, will embrace change and deliver prosperity for all. Je vous remercie, Monsieur Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Now we understand why the Minister of Finance had a photo op with children two days ago. Because children and grandchildren will pay because his actual government lost control of public spending money. This is totally unacceptable. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, one thing has been made crystal clear today, and that's that the Liberal government has completely lost control over public spending. Only two years ago, these people were elected saying that they would run a little deficit of $10 billion, and that they would balance the budget when? In 2019. Well, Mr. Speaker, in 2019, Canadians will be celebrating a deficit of $27.9 billion, Mr. Speaker. That's completely unacceptable. This government is showing contempt for Canadians because it's completely lost control of public spending. Over the next six years, this government will generate deficits of $113 billion. Barely six months ago, they gave a budget update, and they were just off by $13 billion. Well, these people don't know how to count. But worse, Mr. Speaker, as of midnight, Canadians are repaying new taxes, taxes on tobacco, taxes on alcohol, and other taxes. So this government is manufacturing taxes, and it's lost control of public spending. Meanwhile, it's uh, sermonizing to everyone about uh, ecology and the environment, but they've gotten rid of the public transport tax credit. So they say one thing and they, they do the other. When Canada will get back to zero deficit? 
Minister of Finance. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy to be here with my colleagues today to explain our plan. This is an ambitious plan for Canada. It's a plan we started a year and a half ago. We started with measures that really improved uh, the trust that middle class Canadians have in us. And now we can see that our plan is working. We have a lower unemployment rate than we had a year ago. We are entering a much better situation Mr. for the middle Speaker, class in Canada. What we know is that taking that increase in confidence for the middle class and making ambitious investments in the long term, that's what's going to grow our economy. That's what's going to make Canada better for future generations. What the people on the other side of this House don't seem to understand is what happened over the 10 years before we came into office is we didn't make the investments we needed to grow our economy. We've set about to increase confidence, to grow our economy, so that our children and our grandchildren will be better off. Monsieur le Président, ça c'est une plan Mr. Speaker, that is an ambitious plan for the future, and it will be very good for Canadians across the country. Questions and comments, Your Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate for everyone living in poverty and who expected assistance from the government. It's you're going to have to keep waiting because you're going to have to wait until the next federal election when we open the doors and invest in our communities. The Liberal Party, the Liberal government, in this House, has said on several occasions that they would be bridging the gap, making up for the shortfall called for the human, by the Human Rights Tribunal for uh, Aboriginal Children. There is nothing in the budget to fulfill that promise. However, they're continuing, Mr. Speaker, to maintain a loophole for stock options for the richest members of our society, CEOs. They're giving a tax gift to them, to the 1%. The richest 1%. And they're abandoning Aboriginal children. How can they explain that type of shameful behavior? Honorable <laughs> Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the figures are clear. There is a change in this country. 250,000 people over the last few months have found jobs. We have made tangible investments to improve the situation for Canadians. There are some other even more interesting figures, we can now say, with the Canada Child Benefit, that this year, 300,000 children have been lifted out of poverty. And we can also say that we have increased the GIS for seniors and added funding to help lift seniors out of poverty. So the figures are clear. Our plan is having a real impact, and our vision for the future is much better for Canadians. Questions and comments at member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Mr. Speaker, um, I'm looking at the GDP growth projections presented in Budget 2016 and Budget 2017. The GDP growth, real growth projection in 2016 was 1.4 percent. In Budget 2017, it's 1.3 percent. In down. Budget 2016, it was 2.2 percent. In Budget 2017, it's 1.9 percent. In Budget 2016, it was 2.2 percent. In Budget 2017, it's 2.0 percent. And the trend continues. So, Mr. Speaker. From Budget 2016 Failure. to Budget 2017, we've seen a massive increase in the projected deficit yes. that this government has presented, no and yet the government is presenting a decreased uh, projected forecast in real GDP growth. Can happen? the Finance Minister stand to the House and explain, as to many of us who may not be an economist, I am, We're but could he explain exactly what the GDP growth calculation is? And then, so exactly how GDP is calculated, and then why? What part of that calculation is fa is failing due to this budget I don't deficit? Think he has a clue. Can he also explain to Canadians if they're going to stand up and say that this deficit is supposed to create jobs and economic growth? It's not. Why they're why they're showing a decreased GDP growth? Good figure. question. Honourable Minister of Finance. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to talk about our economic situation. What we've seen over the last year is that the ambitious plan that we've put in place is having a real impact. It's having an impact on the most vulnerable in our society by taking children out of poverty. It's having an impact on families who, because of the Canada Child Benefit, have more money to spend that's going into our economy. And so what we're seeing, Mr. Speaker, what we're seeing is very important. We've seen a decline in unemployment. That's critically important. It's gone from 7.1 to 6.6%. What we're seeing as well, Mr. Speaker, is that our economy is proving resilient because of the measures that we put in place. And what we know, Mr. Speaker, is that as we make those investments in the future, we are going to see an increased level of growth. Now, the economists who do their forecasts, they look at the global situation and they put out those numbers. We use those numbers as our base. What I can tell you is that we're ambitious. We want to help Canadians. We know that we will do so. We know that as they get better jobs, more jobs, we will have better economic outcomes. That's the future for Canada, for our children and our grandchildren. Bravo. Questions and comments. Gentleman member for Central Balkan Ogans, Milkmeen Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Finance Minister for his presentation today. I'd like to just uh, follow up with a few things. First of all, both Conservative and Liberal finance ministers in the past, Mr. Speaker, took pride when they presented this place with a balanced budget. Yet this finance minister continues to treat balanced budgets like it's a dirty word. The member from St. Laurent has asked him 16 times when we'll return back to balance, and now we know why, Mr. Speaker, because between the time of the last fall economic update in 2016 to today, six months, we've seen an extra $13 billion that are presented on page 37 of the budget, uh, showing that these guys are spending more and more, and we're hearing that at the economy, the GDP, will go down and down. Mr. Speaker, when will this finance minister present responsible planning for Canada's future? When are they going to stop talking about investments in the middle class? Right now, Mr. Speaker, they're mortgaging the middle class. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we started our plan on our very first day. Right. We took a look at middle class anxiety and we decided that what we were going to do was we were going to ask the richest to pay a little bit more exactly. and we were going to give a tax reduction to the middle class. Then what we did was we, we went further. We helped people with more money for their kids. And what we're seeing is that's making a difference. Unfortunately, the government before us, who racked up over $100 billion in debt themselves, left us with a low growth rate. So making investments is critically important for us to make a difference in the future. That is what we're doing. We're making those investments so we will all be better off in the future. So we will have a situation where the growth rate will make it clear that Canada continues to be a country that can lead the world. That's the ambition we have, leading the world so our children and grandchildren will have great jobs in the future. Here, here. Resuming debate. Honourable Government House Leaders rising at a point of order. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm tabling doc uh, government responses to questions numbers 831 to 836. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate. The Honourable Opposition Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to be the voice of the taxpayer in this time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, the voice, and the voice for Canadians across the country who see today how this government has once again failed to recognize the challenges of regular, hard-working Canadians, the challenges that they're facing. And they were hoping for a break today. They needed a break, and they didn't get one. Instead of taking the necessary steps to help our businesses grow and create jobs, this Liberal budget caters only to the interests of the Prime Minister and his friends, not the families and workers of this country. Instead of lowering taxes and giving people a badly needed break, they're raising taxes and spending more. Now, when I conclude my remarks tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, I will make clear how the Prime Minister's preference for this reckless spending, while never delivering results, is going to hurt Canada today, but also for years to come. But, Mr. Speaker, before I finish, I would like to commend the Finance Minister on one thing, and that is on his choice of footwear because he bought them in my hometown of Edmonton in a great store named Poppy Barley. So thank you for doing that. Um, I much appreciate it. But however, Mr. Speaker, until I move, uh, until then, I move that the debate now be adjourned. Well done. It being 5-10, the House stands...
pursuant to Standing Order 83-2, the debate is adjourned, it being 5-10. The House, this House stands adjourned until tomorrow at 10 a.m. pursuant to Standing Order 24-1.